This time on Animal Airport, Stuart keeps clear of one of the most powerful bites in the natural world. We well, now have no hassle taking your finger off. The race is on to get 10,000 butterfly pupae cleared through customs before the butterflies emerge. It's a rush from now until uh, all the crews have gone this evening. A shipment of deadly snakes arrives at the Ark, but is the crate more dangerous than the contents? Ah. And the night shift has an unusual visitor, a thirsty chimp that refuses water but has a taste for fizzy orange. We wouldn't really condone it or encourage it, but um, animals in captivity sometimes pick up bad habits. With nearly half a million flights a year, Heathrow is the busiest international airport in the world. As well as 65 million human passengers, each year around 40 million animals passing through the airport check in at the Animal Reception Centre, affectionately known as the Ark. It's late evening and Matt Ford, who specialises in the transportation of unusual animals, has arrived at the Ark with a tricky customer renowned for its vicious bite. What's you? Hello, mate. What you got? I've got a turtle for you. Turtles are popular pets, but when they grow too big or too aggressive, some owners simply dump them in Britain's rivers and ponds. The Ark is a good place to keep this one till it can be found a more permanent home. But this alligator-snapping turtle has been off its food since it got caught by a fisherman in a lake in the Midlands. It's just a bit strange that it's not eating. Um, it's normally there, uh, fairly ferocious <laughs> eaters. With its alligator-like shell, this snapping turtle has one of the most powerful bites of any animal. With these sort of turtles, any type of snapping turtle, you always tackle it from, the, from behind. Just literally, you don't want to get your hand anywhere near his face. And I'd say they've got quite a reach. I mean, that'd have no hassle taking your finger off. We'll take some photos like this, and then we'll email them to our vet. Oh, he's, quite, he's got some power on him, mate. He lures unsuspecting prey into his snappy mouth in a very clever way. Inside the base of his mouth, he's got a tiny, tiny little um, pink tongue. It looks like a little worm, so he'll sit there with his mouth open and he'll wriggle his tongue around. Um, so as the fish come along, they'll see the tongue thinking it's a worm. They dart in and touch that, he obviously clamps down and eats the fish. They're worried he may have bitten off more than he can chew when he was caught by the fishermen. So, mate, you want to stick it through the X-ray machine and yeah, check if it's got a hook or not? You're all right, switch it on, Chris. but nothing shows up on the X-ray. We can't see any hooks or even anything that might obstruct. Sorry, His lack of appetite is now a cause for concern. People buy them as pets and then they get a bit too big um, and then uh, think, they do them, think they're doing them a favour by releasing them into a lake. Some animals can go into shock when they're moved from a familiar environment. They can stop eating and even starve themselves to death. Stuart needs to get him feeding again. As reptiles become increasingly popular, domestic pet shipments are on the increase. And while they all require careful inspection, one shipment in particular has Stuart and Chris on their toes. There's just, there's just a warning, that's what's inside. It's a crate that includes some venomous king cobras. One bite could prove deadly. Coming out there. Not a venomous snake, no. Though for the moment it's the crate that's proving deadlier than the contents. With the area secure, Susie and Stuart begin to prise open the first of the boxes. Yeah, oh hang on, we've got a venomous one in there. That, oh, that's the wagglers. So we're going to have to be a bit careful. So one Waggler's Pit Viper, or sometimes called a Temple Viper, which is venomous. 
It's the contents of the second box that Stuart and Susie are most wary of. King Cobras can reach more than five metres in length. Well, the King Cobras are in this box. Um, looks like um, three males, one female. It is the largest venomous snake in the world. And pretty damn deadly. Now you're going to say that now, aren't you? Stuart's already come face to face with one at the Ark. When I was doing a shipment, um, that when we lifted the lid up, there was a cobra just sitting, sitting there. Um, no bag. So either it was got in there by accident or someone deliberately put a loose cobra in for us to find. A single bite from a king cobra contains enough venom to kill 20 people. <laughs> no lifting that up, that's huge, look, that's huge. This one is... Look at that. That's a male as well. Hissing away as well. Happy? Yes. Now they know the cobras are alive and well, this is as close to these snakes as Stuart and Susie need to get. Meanwhile, an unusual call has come in. A dog's travelled from Atlanta in the cabin with its owners. It's only now they've declared it at customs, and Chris is dispatched to Terminal 4 to investigate. It's in a bag, so I'm going out there to pick the dog up and bring it back to our place. It's usually forbidden to carry animals into the UK in the cabin of an aircraft, so Chris isn't sure that it's travelling legally. It's just going to be a rabies risk if, if it doesn't get seen or it's going to go straight through the terminal. It's imperative that Chris locates what could turn out to be an illegal entry. But despite working at Heathrow for seven years... I don't think I've been to the Red Channel either at Terminal 4, so I've got to find out where that is as well. I'm looking for the Red Channel. Green Channel, Customs. Can I get through this way? Yeah. Is it? Up this stairs, turn on the side. Thank you very much. Cheers. I love walking around the terminal. At the Ark, despite everyone's best efforts, the alligator snapping turtle is still refusing to eat. Stuart's tried tempting him with some day old chicks, but without any luck. He's got no interest in that at all, but he just wants to get away. Now he has a cunning plan. I thought we'd um, boost the water temperature up a little bit by putting a heater in. So, what we're going to do, we're going to uh, get him out, and then we'll put a mat in that's going to cover all the heater so he can't bite any of the cables or actually the heater itself. So obviously with a mouth like that, it could do some damage. Just another little trick of the trade to see if we can get him to feed. Like most turtles, he hates the cold. If Stuart can trick him into thinking he's back in the US Everglades, he might get his appetite back. We're only going to be 10 minutes. He'll be happy just sitting there for a little while. Stuart hopes a warming pad will raise the water temperature by several degrees, making the turtle comfortable in the warm water. The more relaxed he is, the better the chances that he'll feed. It looks like it could still be a long wait. Also amongst the reptiles are Lloyd and Kaylee, who, unlike Stuart, are relative newcomers, and they've got to clean out the snakes. By snake standards, this Burmese python is relatively docile. He may suffocate and swallow his prey whole, but the only threat to this pair isn't physical, it's psychological. I haven't handled many snakes in my life, so handling something like this, a big snake, gives you confidence to handle one of the other snakes that are a bit more aggressive to handle. Lloyd used to be more at home walking his pet Jack Russell, rather than a two-metre snake. I was nervous because, one, I haven't done it without Stuart, and two, it's like Kaylee's first, the second time doing it. We've taken out and put it back in with absolutely no problems at all. At Terminal 4, Chris has finally located the dog and its owners, waiting in the red channel. I'm Chris from the animal reception. Do you have paperwork and stuff? Yeah, yeah, it's actually all just, just over here. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering why it hasn't come in as cargo. Um, she's a support animal, so she, she flies right. in the plane. Right, okay. Hiding in the bag is Zoe, the miniature dachshund. As a support animal, she's been allowed to travel in the cabin as her owners are nervous flyers. We should have been notified beforehand. 
when we were booking the flights and I asked them if there's anything I need to do or if I need to, and they tell you, and they said no, because she's flown in before to the UK. I'll have a word with my manager to see what he wants to do. Hi, Rob. Um, I'm with a gentleman now. He's been before at Gatwick. Um, he's got passport here and third country as well documents. Um, but it's not registered with a company. You know, she's, she's got all her paperwork and her letter. Support animals should be registered before they fly and intercepted upon landing at the door of the plane. This ensures that the health check is completed on arrival and that the passenger's pet is cleared through the UK border. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. In future, sure. if you um, come through and give us a ring, what I'll do is I'll give you our, our number, yeah, be okay? Because yeah. um, there should be a charge as well, okay? Yeah. Um, because it's not registered with a company, mm -hmm. then there should have been a charge, but we're going to let you off this time. They let us go through this time because all of her paperwork and all of her vaccinations are in order and she does have the pet passport. But we're going to have to look into getting her registered with um, Support Animal Service since she is a support animal. Thank well, you, thank very, you much. very much. Take care. Little Zoe is oblivious to all the trouble she's caused. There she is. She's got a wee jumper. <laughs> so. Back at the Ark, another shipment of reptiles is giving Stuart and Susie the runaround. The top layer of the crate contains some geckos, but several have escaped. They're fast, and after a seven-hour flight from Ghana, they're in no mood to go straight back in their boxes. Very speedy. But it's the second layer of the shipment that gives them cause for concern. According to the paperwork, there are almost 60 boss lizards in just four sacks. Susie's immediately worried about their welfare. That is pretty disgusting. She needs to check the lizards haven't been packaged illegally. We don't have any individual space whatsoever. Um, 13 in this one, all that size, pretty much. We've just had a BA vehicle just turn up to pick up these reptiles, but we're not letting them go at the moment because we've got an issue, obviously, with the amount of, amount of monitors in, yeah. in a bag. For now, the lizards are being detained. Unless they can move them quickly on, they're going to face a massive headache working out where to house them. It looks like they'll be staying. Around 4,500 cats travel through Heathrow every year. For their owners, it's a big relief when they arrive fit and healthy. One cat that doesn't seem to have fared too well has just flown in from Morocco. Some animals can find flying an ordeal, and this one appears particularly disorientated. Animal health officer Anne is worried he might have been sedated before flying. I've just gone out on the airport and brought back a little cat. He looks fine, but he's obviously sedated. He doesn't seem to have enough energy to come out of his box, so Anne's going to have to take the crate apart. We know he's sedated because that third eyelid, which is from the corner up into the middle of his eye there, is right up. Well-meaning owners sometimes sedate their pets before they travel to make them drowsy. But the effects of sedatives, especially on cats, can be unpredictable. And it's not possible to monitor them while they're in the hold. If it's, if it's slightly cold in the hold and then they're sedated as well, then they can freeze. Um, they can come in. They, they've arrived dead before um, if they've been sedated. Anne's happy the cat will be fine. He just needs to sleep it off. Over in quarantine, Stuart has called in Deputy Manager Tristan to check the lengths of the lizards. So we need to measure snout vent length. So this is the vent here. So we're going to measure that straight line up to the tip of the snout. There are international rules governing the transportation of reptiles. How they're packed depends on their size, and that means measuring this one. It's well over eight inches, so they should be packed one per bag. There's 12 to this bag, and there's 13 to another one. Lizards more than eight inches long need a bag each, but some of the smaller ones can share. 
we're basically cutting the numbers down that are in the, in the bags, to basically for the animal's welfare, to give them more space. So it's better so they travel better, really. Stuart's been raiding the laundry basket. These are just literally pillowcases that you'd use in your house. Um, the best things to use, really. Because they're quite soft. Hessian sometimes is a bit coarse and a bit rough. Uh, you wouldn't bother the big monitors, but things little, like, things like these. You want to give them comfort. Fortunately, it's not Egyptian silk. Like moving them from economy to premium. Anne and Magic the Vet have taken delivery of a shipment of 10,000 butterfly pupae. Every animal that's coming in from outside Europe has to have a vet check it. Magic is on hand to examine this shipment from Belize in Central America. They always check to see um, that they're all still moving and that they're alive. They'll be looking at general packing requirements, so this is nicely packed with lots of insulation to keep the pupae the right temperature. Um, and each pupae has its own section that it sits in so that they're not rolling around in the box or anything. The transformation from caterpillar to butterfly inside the pupae can take as little as two weeks. These have already been traveling for four days and some will be processed and shipped to foreign destinations. They need to be moved quickly or they could emerge and die in transit. Excellent. That's your three boxes from Thailand. Three Thailand. Yep. And then from the other side. Right, OK, I'll sort them out. Richard runs a worldwide butterfly distribution centre. Packages from Thailand. As well as a butterfly farm open to the public. He sends pupae to collectors around the world. So now he's against the clock. There you go. Speed is the key, yes. I've got to hit air connections this evening uh, at East Midlands and various other parts of the world. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a rush from now until uh, all the crews have gone this evening. The Stratford Butterfly Farm in the British Midlands is an unlikely hub for a global trade in butterflies. The 10,000 pupae that passed through the Ark this week now have to be counted, checked and repacked in this unique sorting office. The race is on. We will focus today on the shipments going a long way away. So if we've got, for instance, shipments going to New Zealand, the States, South Africa, Canada, places like that, where it's more than one day in transit, we want to try and get those away today. And uh, that reduces the risk of anything emerging in transit, which is something we absolutely don't want to happen. No time for jet lag for these butterflies to be. They'll be back in the air tonight before the next 10,000 arrive at Heathrow the same time next week. Now a temporary resident at the Ark, the alligator snapping turtle is still refusing to eat. But could Stuart's waiting game finally be over? Right, little snapper. Oh, it's nice and nice and warm in here. The underwater temperatures, literally at the ideal, the ideal setting. And we've noticed as I've come in every every few days to check on him, he's been moving around quite a lot and looking for food. He's due to move on to a sea life centre, but he's got to eat before Stuart will let him go. So hopefully, he will have something to eat. Now, I don't know whether he'll eat both of them, but he'll definitely, have, uh, he'll definitely have one, I think. I've got faith in him. Will four weeks of coaxing and careful handling finally pay off? It's a result for Stuart. A highly unusual arrival has just flown in from Hong Kong. A rabbit called Wooza. You don't have a lot of rabbits come in, especially pet rabbits, not really. While there are plenty of bunnies already in Britain, at eight years old, this is an elderly and much-loved family pet. 
destined to see out its years at a new home in the UK. But not before spending the night at the Ark. No Cantonese carrots here, but a nibblesome menu nonetheless. There are far stranger dietary requirements for one nighttime arrival. Billy the Chimp has spent his whole life in a rundown zoo in Bulgaria. Now 15 years old, he's been rescued and is en route to a sanctuary for primates in South Wales. It's a long journey, and he's making a pit stop at the Ark. During his transportation, sanctuary owner Graham has been keeping a close eye on him. We've got cameras on the back of the on the back and the front of the uh, cages, and they're colour cameras, infrared, so we can see him 24 hours. Billy was not having uh, too much of it. He pulled the the cover over the lens three times, so he had to stop and reset it. <laughs> the Ark staff are on hand to provide some much-needed refreshment for Billy. Got some pears, some apple, some veg. But Billy is refusing to drink. The reason appears to lie in the way he's been brought up. The team have little choice but to give him what he wants, fizzy orange. It's not necessarily the best thing, but it is better than nothing. Um, he's used to it, apparently, and it's better that he has some sort of liquid than, uh, than nothing at all. So that's why we wouldn't really condone it or encourage it, but... Um, animals in captivity sometimes pick up bad habits. It's hoped that over the coming months, the keepers at the Wales Ape and Monkey Sanctuary will be able to finally wean him off sugary drinks. It's really special to have a one-to-one, -one, um, just a, a brief moment with um, but very rare exotic species. It's really special. It's now 10 days since the batch of 10,000 butterfly pupae passed through the Ark. Some were shipped out of the country, but a few remained, and now they've begun to emerge as adults. These are the pupa that we uh, picked up from the Ark a couple of weeks ago. This is the magical bit of the butterfly house. Inside the pupa, the whole body of the caterpillar melts into something like lumpy custard. And when it's ready, it cracks open the pupa, hauls its abdomen and its wings out, and then it grabs onto the, the branch and then it starts pumping its wings up. Absolute magical transformation from something that looks totally inanimate to a living, fluttering butterfly. Yet despite the international travel and the efforts of the Ark and the Butterfly team, the life of these butterflies is a short one. Just hang them up to dry in the warm air. You see a dull brown butterfly, then it opens wings and, and it flashes electric blue. Even here, sheltered from predators, they'll live for little more than three weeks. Boozer, the geriatric Hong Kong bunny, was made a very special resident at the quarantine centre and has since been reunited with his rabbit-loving owners. The alligator-snapping turtle has now been safely rehomed at the Weymouth Sea Life Centre, where his appetite is voracious and his jaws are very much back in action. And after a life spent in isolation, Billy the Chimp is making his first real friends amongst an entire family of fellow chimpanzees.